Hi everyone, hope you're well. Um, what I'm doing here is something a little bit more formal than usual. I'm actually recording the last 10 minutes of the session that we were exploring last week on archaeology and fascism. I've been desperately trying to find a window of time to do it. And at 11 o'clock on Saturday night, um, I managed to find a, a little bit of a window. So yeah, it's, um, it's an interesting day. Joe Biden has just been... Um, acknowledged not confirmed acknowledged as the next president of the united states so that's what happened today and 11 o'clock at that time of day we are considering the relationship between archaeology and fascism in this instance in italy um so what we've been doing in the class is exploring the way in which um archaeology in the context of nazi germany have been heavily uh, manipulated to the extent that um, results from some archaeological excavations were just being completely falsified to push a particular um, nationalistic agenda. When we look at what was taking place in Italy, things are a little bit different. And th they're different because Italy, of course, has the benefit of the Roman Empire. You know, from a propaganda perspective, you don't have to go out of your way to make things up about the legacy of Italy in terms of European and, depending on which direction you go, uh, global um, uh, cultural influences. You know, the Roman Empire was pretty far spread um, and left a lot of um, quite striking and very large scale um, architectural legacies and of course, of course cultural legacies as well. So in terms of the fascist Italian state making use of um, historical narrative as contemporary allegory um, was a much easier process. It was also made easier because there were some nations who were sort of uh, willing participants in the process of, of opening up uh, their borders and territories for foreign archaeologists to come in um, to pursue whatever narrative agenda they had for their own personal benefit. So whilst I'm talking primarily about um, Italian fascist archaeologists, um, we start off with a picture here of King Zog of Albania. Um, this is King Zog the I. Um, he reigns from, what do we think, about 1922 through to 1939 when things obviously um, go south for Albania. Yeah, 1922-1939. Um, he gives himself the title of King Zog I. It's pretty rare for um, kings who are you know, the first of their name, without wanting to get too Game of Thronesy about it, um, to have a number. But he felt he needed a number, so King Zog got himself a number. There was also briefly a King Zog II. His son um, was notionally uh, his successor, but I don't think was ever formally acknowledged as King of Albania. So he missed out on, on a Zog uh, dynasty. Um, nonetheless, this is King Zog. Um, Zog was... Um, fairly shrewd in the sense that he knew he needed to position um, Albania um, in relation to geographical uh, allies or potential allies. Um, and one of the ways he did this was through um, opening his country up for archaeologists. So we had um, interest from both French archaeologists and Italian archaeologists um, to try and explore um, cultural legacies. Um, Italy was a little bit more proactive in terms of pushing the cultural legacies, and we'll come on to that um, in a moment. But Zog was quite happy for foreign influences to come in on the premise that they might help stabilise political alliances uh, in the present. Now, of course, it backfires on Albania. Um, Italy will um, subsume Albania for a time. Um, but nonetheless, Zog was trying to be strategic in terms of those relationships. Um, in a broader sense, um, we know that um, uh, Italian interest in foreign archaeology um, is manifest in a number of different locations, uh, most notably Libya. Um, and earlier in the fascism module, we've actually talked about the way in which there was significant investment um, from uh, the PUF in Italy in Libyan archaeological sites. Um, both in terms of excavation, but also conservation, restoration, um, reinstating, if you like, the cultural legacy of Rome as a justification 
for contemporary Italian influence and presence as we go through the 1930s. So um, just as um, we can say that much of the way in which you access the archaeology and you know the uh, the classical Roman legacies uh, that you find in Rome today, much as we can, in a sense, thank uh, Italian fascism for the root ways that they remember we talked about the way in which um, there was significant urban clearance and um, urban sort of reshaping of uh, the landscape of Rome in order to create uh, more accessible route ways from one um, classic. Uh, example of great Roman architecture to another. Um, you know, the processional routeway that you uh, can walk or drive down towards the Colosseum, that's, that's all 1930s um, redevelopment taking place in Italy. Um, done so in order to facilitate your access routes to the Colosseum. Um, so again, if, if you find yourself in Rome and you're taking that walkway up to the Colosseum, um, be conscious you are walking through uh, a fascist 1930s landscape as much as you are a classical Roman landscape. Um, so this is a long established uh, practice of, of building upon and reinstating the importance of the uh, classical Roman uh, Italian narrative um, to enhance the legitimacy, uh, sorry, the legitimacy of the uh, contemporary uh, Italian fascist influence in whatever particular area that we're looking at. And Libya stands as a good example um, of that. Now, one of the key players that we have in terms of Italian fascist archaeology is Luigi Maria Ugolini. Um, Ugolini is an interesting figure in, in the respect that the standards of his archaeological practice were pretty high. Um, he is respected as an archaeologist, um, and yet he is derided as a fascist. So the standards of the work that he's conducting are, are, are pretty high. Um, you know, he's pursuing a lot of the techniques which you might be describing as pioneering or at least advancing the field of archaeology, um, yet his legacy is perhaps obviously tarnished because of the relationship uh, between his work and fascism. Um, and I think we can clearly see the way in which um, Uglini is buying into um, the ideology at the time. He um, comes back to Italy at one stage and delivers a speech um, in which this quotation is taken from where he talks of the, uh, the friendship of 3,000 years uh, between Albania and um, Italy. And he's doing this based on the archaeology. Now, of course, that's, depending on how you want to spin things, that's not strictly inaccurate. Friendship might be too strong, but we certainly know there is a relationship uh, between Italy and Albania, or at least those geographical territories that would have existed 3,000 years ago. There's certainly that relationship. Um, a little bit of conquest and expansion going on from one into the other. So do we view that as friendship per se? Um, well, it's all a question of how you are packaging and presenting this. But Uglini plays his part in using the archaeological work that he's conducting um, as a means by which he can enhance and bolster a contemporary narrative um, of a relationship between the two states in a contemporary context. Um, worth adding, uh, the very start of this I mentioned that Ugolini, um, sorry not Ugolini, that uh, King Zog sorry, um, was looking to play nations off against each other. One of the catalysts for uh, Italian uh, archaeological activity in Albania was the fact that there was uh, this French presence as well. This is photographs from uh, one of the French expeditions coming to um, Albania. Um, similar political objectives, looking to get that cultural foothold in Albania, looking to uh, draw upon uh, the evidence for cultural links between the two states in whatever period it might be. Um, so France is looking to do the same sort of thing and that serves as a, as a degree of encouragement uh, for Italy to, to crack on and pursue similar lines. And the site that they really focus on uh, is Boutrint. Um, and as you can see from this image um, of one of the sites that's being excavated at Boutrint, um, there is no shortage of 
uh, Roman slash Italian archaeological evidence. And there's this remarkable concept, um, uh, a wonderful archaeological resource, um, complete with um, a healthy body of material culture, a lot of statues that are being found that are commemorating emperors um, and deities relevant to Rome. And so there are the materials there which allow for the narrative of um, Roman presence to be celebrated. You know, and it all comes back to the idea of packaging. Um, there's a, uh, um, a very well presented museum at Butrint today. And it has a strong online presence. You can explore the, the, the online museum at your leisure. Um, but that museum archive is really the product of Ugolini's work slash a fascist funded archaeological expedition coming from Italy into Albania. That's where the bulk of that material has come from. Um, which is interesting. Now, again, let's just underline this quickly. The examples that we look at in relation to Italian fascist archaeology generally is built upon work that, for the period that we're talking about, the 1930s, is of a pretty high standard in terms of archaeological work. I don't think there's that much that we can say or critique in terms of the notion of fabrication of evidence. Um, as you can see, you don't need to fabricate it. But what is perhaps questionable about some of the archaeological work that we're seeing in a fascist Italian context um, is the way in which it is being packaged. What is the purpose and motivation behind this? Was the work that was being taken uh, undertaken at Butrint there because of genuine archaeological interest? Or was it being undertaken there with an eye to legitimizing Italian political influence in Albania at that point in time? And really, that, that seems to be the, the, the core catalyst, certainly in terms of funding and certainly in terms of what is ultimately underpinning why those Italian archaeologists are where they are when they are in Albania in the 1930s. So again, it's it's a slightly messy one to critique because as I say, standards are high, um, the archaeology is real, but the thing that we were exploring in the, in the session that we did last week together was really motivation. Motivation and interpretation. What are you doing with that interpretation? Archaeology is fluid, is malleable. Um, so much of what is presented to us can be recognisable, it can be solid, it can be large and have you know, recognisable form and function. But all of our understanding in relation to archaeology um, is dependent on interpretation. And that is something that can differ remarkably from one person to the next for genuine archaeological interpretive reasons. But it can also change dramatically for political motivation. And I think that's certainly something we do see coming out of the Italian archaeology funded by the fascist state at this point in time. So keep in mind, perhaps, that the, the most important thing is um, a point we drew up in the seminar session last week, that all knowledge is socially constructed. This information, its starting point, the reason the excavations took place was politically motivated. The way in which the interpretations and conclusions are being drawn and shaped are ultimately politically motivated. And when you do that, when you allow for those motivations to come in, you can very easily change the past in a sense, subtly, um, to fulfil objectives in a contemporary cultural context. This is an ongoing practice, it's worth saying. Um, in the last decade, for instance, we've seen um, uh, significant um, archaeological activities funded by the Chinese state uh, taking place in Kenya, I believe. Um, and again, the, 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 the evidence is encouraging in the sense of uh, 
good archaeological evidence being found which suggests trade links between the two but why is that happening well china is investing heavily um, in industry in that part of the african continent and so by using archaeology you can justify your presence there if you're saying well look there's there's southeast asian uh, trade evidence here from however many uh, hundreds or thousands of years ago that justifies chinese presence there in uh, in a contemporary cultural context this is not a new process and it's not a process that has gone away it's a very potent template archaeology is a is a very strong useful and often quite an emotive resource uh, to be exploited and made use of um, so hopefully that's of use um, and i'm happy to explore this in more detail if you have any follow-up questions uh, but that's all i want to say on this for now um, King Zog is interesting. We can talk more about him at another time. But for now, um, hopefully that gives you a sense of the way in which um, archaeology coming out of fascist Italy uh, is being used, abused, perhaps certainly manipulated to fulfill the goals of the PUF at that point in time in the 30s and an interest in terms of influence and expanding ultimately into Albania um, and to a lesser extent Libya as well. OK. Uh, We'll see you in the class uh, during the week. Thanks very much if you stopped by.